Welcome back. Our next guest is a chef so talented that someone offered her $100,000 after tasting a curry chicken dish she had prepared. This is a true story. She used that money to open her first restaurant, the successful Saturday Dinette in Toronto's East End. And despite that good fortune, it hasn't always been smooth sailing. Now she's sharing her journey as a black female chef, navigating the power imbalance culinary industry in a new memoir that I loved. Please welcome the author of My Aki Tree, Suzanne Barr. Hi. Oh, Suzanne, Hi. we are so... We've been talking about this for a long time, and our co-hosts are very jealous <laughs> that we're being able to sit with you and try your food. So let's talk about your journey. Um, uh, the curry dish, the $100,000 curry dish. Um, um, we, we're going to talk about this wonderful book. Like, Talk about this remarkable dish and how that whole story came to be. 100%. Um, 100%. 100%. 100%. Day. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it still to me is kind of a surprise even like to hear it out loud in audio because writing the book was a process already to put it on paper. Um, finding like this, this reality that was like my truth, but always knowing my mom was with me mm. because I feel like for something like this to happen and to me in my life, it had to come from an angel investor. And I just really felt so much of her spirit and understanding, like, how do I navigate through this? Like, is this really happening? And talking to a lot of friends and family to support me through making, what's the decision? What do I want to do with this? And, you know, is this is this a reality? And is this someone going to take it back from me? So you were in New York. You were and somebody, was living in... It was a private event? Private event. I was, you know, we had... I So it was a private event. I was a private chef at the time. And I was preparing a meal for um, a bat mitzvah. I and mean, can we? we? We understand yeah, that right Please, okay. don't <laughs> let it sit there. Oh, okay. And with that conversation came the, the, this person coming into the kitchen and saying to me, what would you need to make this happen? And I was just like, well, what do you mean? Like, yeah, it's just curry. It's like some chicken. It's some rice, you know, and... and no, it's not. <laughs> no. Uh, I just put that in my mouth. That is not just some curry, some chicken, and some rice. <laughs> that is delicious. And we went from that conversation to, okay, the next day, I want you to tell me what would you need to bring your, your reality to life? And that transferred into a whole slew of next steps and this like awakening like is this really happening and then this bank account amount like transferred into my and it was like is this really happening and so sat on the money for a bit and tried to figure out like what did I want to do and I think really truly like knowing now that Saturday Dinette had a home mm. it had a purpose it had a reason fundamentally like it was everything I knew I needed to do mm. and it and it didn't have to happen in that immediate sense it just needed to take the time and the right amount of time is what it did and you mentioned home uh, you begin talking in the book about the idea of home being really hard to find because you were born in Toronto you grew up in Florida your ancestors are from Jamaica and you've lived many other places for periods of time uh, so how have you grappled with that idea of what home means to you throughout your life I mean, I think I still grapple with it. I think most people do. You know, being an immigrant child, like, we are, we can see and trace the facts of immigration and colonization, and we can see the movement of what has happened over history and how that pulls people apart, pulls families away from each other, but sometimes it brings us back together. So for me, you know, teaching my son, teaching myself and my partner, we are both immigrant kids, and understanding that home is not necessarily where a physical place, it can be actually exactly where you need it to be. Mm -hmm. And that is in our kitchen. That is cooking the food that makes me connected to those home places. I love this idea of your home being in the kitchen. I and mean, you certainly describe that in the book with your husband and your son, Miles. And you talk also about the fear that you had during your pregnancy, knowing that you were having a mixed race child who was gonna be this really interesting combination, Greek, Jamaican, Australian, Canadian, Taurus, that you describe him as. <laughs> He's almost seven. So I'm curious about how your feelings surrounding um, his identity have changed. And if there's any questions that have come up that have surprised you. Well, I think he celebrates it. He celebrates the fact that he's Greek, he's Jamaican, he's Canadian and American. And so with that celebration, I have, you know, almost surrendered to trying to give him any more understanding. And I just allow him to go through his life, you know, asking questions when necessary and me just guiding him through the, the best way that I can possibly do. And the same way with my husband, we do the same. We just kind of like allow him to like explore, ask questions, but be surrounded by community that celebrates it is yeah. what really brings him, 
you know, all the, all the worth that he know he needs, so. Uh, my son's a little bit older than yours. He also has a mixed cultural background. He's also a stubborn eater and a Taurus. <laughs> um, so lots of connections there. But so let's talk about the food in your house. Like, are you are you finding that your son is, is curious in the way that you are and eating everything? Or is it, like, what's his palate like? 100% not. <laughs> he is like, wait a minute. Like, I want grilled cheese. I want this. Like, he has his moments. He's pretty much stubborn in all of the Taurus like yeah. archetypes. Like I'm just like, you are a true Taurus. And so I appreciate that. He knows what he likes, he knows what he wants, and he's gonna command that. So I think that's gonna help him later in life. So a gift, <laughs> I hope, and I know, and I feel, and I love, and I know that he's gonna be great. But yeah, we have, our, we have some struggles, but I, I always go back to, well, if you're hungry, Food's there, so I would suggest you eat. <laughs> <laughs> and he listens to Chef, to Chef Mama. You speak so powerfully about your son, but you speak so kindly and honestly about your mother in the book. Her life uh, and your time caring for her when she was battling cancer. She passed away when you were in your 20s, but you've remained connected to her through food. So I'm curious to know what recipe reminds you the most of her, and do you still have that Red Bull? A hundred percent I have that bowl. That bowl is like imprinted with the, like the dishwasher, like stains and melting marks and the scratches and her nails and her rings. Like it's a part of my life that will always be a part of my life. When I went home to find the bowl, my dad was like, why are you taking it? And I was like, I just, I need to hold it just to connect and to stay connected with her. So it's something that I, from time to time, put things in and I always go back to. But the dish that really reminds me of her is the, in the, in the cookbook, is um, the Dutch apple pie. Mm. Mm. It is, was her dish that she made on Sundays. Yes. It was how Suzanne Hancock and I actually connected and came about writing this book. And I made that dish with Suzanne on her podcast and that's what really kind of brought me back to my mom and food and loving and connecting to home. So yeah. it is that that recipe that I, I really push for anyone to, that's the first recipe you should try. Oh, so well, beautiful. and that poem you read about the Red Bull in the book, I just, I love it so much. Anyway, I love that yeah. Red Bull, yes. Um, <laughs> you know, what's interesting is is that you're, you were kind of on a different path and it wasn't until you were 30 that you decided that you wanted to become a chef. Before that, you had this great job, you're in New York at MTV and then you left it all behind to go to culinary school. That's a bold move <laughs> and you lived in many other places, took lots of different leaps and right now, uh, we're in really uncertain times, no matter what. You know, anyone who's watching, like there's there's just a lot out there. Um, how have you been able to just give some advice here, conquer your fears and learn to live with risk and uncertainty and, and maybe be taking bold leaps? Yeah, and I think we're gonna continue to do that. I think we're gonna continue to question, is this the right decision? And you know, I think of anything that I can say is find that reimagination. Like that is the word that really came, resonated so much for me during 2020 with the closure of True True Diner, with the closure of even Saturday Dinette. It was like, reimagine what's possible. Taking it one day at a time, breathing, you know, reaching out to community. You don't have to suffer silently. You don't have to suffer by yourself. You don't have to think that you have to take on everything in that moment. You know, things kind of come and pass through us. They wash over us, but they don't have to consume us. We can actually imagine that Maybe tomorrow is going to look different. Sh making those shifts, mm -hmm. those slight shifts are, are really what I kind of always reflect back to. And it's what gives me that sense of home and it gives me that sense of it's going to be okay and today's a new day and tomorrow is going to be tomorrow. Mm. And you take slight shifts, but you make big shifts in the world of food advocacy. That's something that you're very passionate about. And you've really uh, created programs that advocate for silenced voices to have a presence and for equality in the restaurant industry. How do you think that food has the power to impact the world and initiate that kind of change? Well, I think we've seen it throughout you know, history. Breaking bread is like one of the oldest traditions that we still practice today. You know, being, whether it's in your home kitchen or in a restaurant or cafe, wherever it is, food brings people together. You know, living in the city of Toronto taught me a lot about the, how the diversity and the cultural opportunities to taste food from everywhere. It doesn't limit you. And I think that that's what that food and that understanding that food can bridge us. It can give us memories. It can give us nostalgia. It gives us comfort. And that is something that we all simply are sometimes just wanting. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be so complicated. It just needs to be familiar and it has to touch those places that we sometimes need the most. 
Suzanne, you are such a delight. Thank you so much for coming here and sharing your beautiful, beautiful food stories with us. And this amazing. I'm so glad you have to do the extra sin because oh I'm just going to eat. Oh my gosh! Thank you so much for being here. Really, such thank a treat. You.